Well, a very warm welcome and sincere apologies for taking so long to get started. Sorry to those if you're waiting online. We had a little bit of trouble with our YouTube streaming, but we are live now. So a very warm welcome to everyone here in person, uh, but also coming in online. We do have a number of families who are isolating or uh, have come down with COVID. So uh, we, we miss you and uh, we, we are praying for you and hope you, you, you're well. And we look forward to renewing fellowship with you in person soon. So a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for your patience in bearing with me. Uh, before we begin, there are some notices. Let me remind you, uh, they're not on the, the back here, any specific ones. This Thursday, we have our uh, church Christmas party, and that's at Robin's house from six o'clock. Uh, so it is, uh, please come and bring, it's nibble food, so bring savory, bring sweet, mince pies, that sort of thing. Some mulled wine and mulled apple juice will be available as well. So that's at Robin's house from six. We'll have a quiz and some fellowship together, and we might sing some carols and just have a good time. So uh, do come along. It might be helpful to Robin and those of us helping out if you let her know you're definitely coming or not, uh, and maybe what you're bringing in terms of food, that would be really helpful. I will get an email out on Tuesday just to remind you, uh, but it would be good for us to gather for that. Uh, there is, as well, there's a big, I forgot to mention this on um, this morning. This morning feels like a long time ago. Uh, there's a baby shower, isn't there? over at Deborah's place on Saturday, 10.30. Ask Deborah if you want, want to know more information about that. So that's this Saturday. Uh, then next Sunday, God willing, we are meeting 10.30 and 5, St. Luke's and here. We will be having our carol services, so we're looking forward to that. And then in the run-up to Christmas, please do take note, on the Monday we've got a Kids Christmas Club here. On the Tuesday afternoon, the youth are invited to Robin's house. On the Friday, which is the Christmas Eve, that's correct, is it? That is Christmas Eve. Okay. Um, at five o'clock, we're having a Christmas Eve service here. And then we don't have anything Christmas Day. I'm sorry. Uh, we couldn't secure any a location for a, a Christmas Day service. But we are having a Christmas Eve service here at five o'clock. And then uh, we will have our services as usual on the Sunday. The only thing is it might not be usual because uh, hopefully our morning location for the 26th of December and the 2nd of January. Well, we know they won't be at St. Luke's. It's the two Sundays in the year we can't get into St. Luke's. The university closed down all their kind of public buildings and so we can't get into them. Uh, we're trying to get into Wycliffe Hall. Uh, and if we can't get into Wycliffe Hall, then watch this space. We'll see what we do. We may have to have an online service, but we will be meeting in person on those Sundays in the evening here at five o'clock. Sorry, there's an awful lot of information there to take hold of. Um, I will put it out in an email again this week so that you're clear on everything, but do ask if you've got any questions, etc. Good for us to be gathered to worship our God, the Triune God. It's great to have David Pfeiffer with us and um, a, a valued member of his congregation, Steve, great, who, who's his chauffeur. Wonderful, very warm welcome to you. I'll be in, in, introducing David uh, as he comes to preach for us in a little bit. As we come to worship our God, let's listen to these words from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Our God blesses us with every good thing. Let's all bow together and pray and call upon his name and bless him. Let's pray together. Oh Lord our God, what a joy and a delight it is for us to close out this first day of the week, to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he triumphed over the devil, this world, and our sin. And we come to rejoice because we are a people who are blessed. And we have every reason to come and return that blessing to you, to worship you and honour you and adore you. Help us, we pray, as we sing, as we bow in prayer, as we hear from your word. Help us to love you and delight in you. And remind us, Lord, above everything else, that in Christ we have every blessing, every spiritual blessing 
from the heavenly places. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's join our voices to sing uh, a hymn that's based on that Psalm 103. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let's stand. possessor. Everything we are is first from you. Everything we have we owe to you. Every moment we have to live and breathe and have our being is in you and is in many ways borrowed from you. And so we come, O Lord, to express tonight not just our worship but our dependence on you. And not just our worship and our dependence but we come to confess our sin. Because, O oh Lord, we act and we live as if we were the creators. We act and live as if we were the ones that sustained our lives. As if the air we breathe, as if the, the beating of our hearts and the coursing of blood through our veins and to the cells in our body was because of us. As if the days that we live and the successes 
that we have and the entertainments that we enjoy and the gifts that we use as if we have made them, have created them, as if they owe their existence to us, as if we were gods. Lord, we confess this to you and we ask for your forgiveness. We throw ourselves upon your mercy and we pray that you would waken us up again to this daily, to this hourly, to this minute by minute and second by second dependence that we have on you. Lord, we are so thankful for your mercy, that you are the God who, who sent the Lord Jesus Christ to a people and to a world that had rejected your word previously, as we heard this morning, that, that had plotted and conspired to even kill your son, your beloved son, your only son, your chosen one, your king, your prophet, your priest. And Lord, your answer, though it could have been to crush us, your answer was to crush him, to lay upon him the iniquity of us all, to lay on his shoulders the sin of those that had rebelled against you. And so he, in his death, took our just desert for sin upon himself so that you, the gracious, glorious, good God, could save your people to yourself. We marvel again in that, that beloved chosen one, who was crushed for our iniquities and yet has now become that chief cornerstone on which and in which your church is being built, in whom we have hope uh, for, forever. We praise you and we thank you. Please, Lord, can, would you cleanse us from our sin? Please give us a holy hatred for all that is wrong, for all that rebels against your holy command. Please give us, even this week, a distaste of everything that is an expression of our fallen rebellion in Adam. And Lord, replace that, that hankering, that loving of self and of sin. And, and replace it, Lord, with a love of you and a love of Christ and a love of your word and a love of your people and a love for the lost and a love for what is good and right and noble and peaceful. Please, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to stir us up and to change us, each and every one of us. Change the youngest of us. Change our children, Lord. We pray that you'd give our children a, a distaste, a holy hatred for darkness. And you'd give them a love, a holy passion for light and for truth and for love and goodness and for Jesus Christ. Lord, help us in our daily lives to renew a a commitment to you, a love for you. Give us a prayerful spirit that we would find ourselves devoting times to prayer, but also in our, the busyness of our lives, walking before you and praying and communing. And when we meet those who don't know you, asking that they would come to know you. As we spend time with loved ones and brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would be seeking to bless them and praying for them and lifting up their needs at your throne of grace. Would you put on our hearts the great call of mission that you've given to the church, that we would pray for the mission of the church and missionaries in the church, that your gospel would advance. Lord, would you give us, would you give us a love for, for those that don't know you, that are, are turning their back on you or feeling the effect of a life without Christ. Give us a holy compassion for those that don't know you. Lord, we need your work in our lives in these ways and in so many others, please. Change us, transform us, cleanse us from our sin, renew us in Jesus Christ, make us more like our Saviour. Help us, we do pray. And even as we pray these things, we come with those words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we come to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, 
So great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our friend. He remembers that we are dust. What wonderful words of comfort to us. What a compassionate father we have who is infinitely greater than we are, and yet he knows that we're, we're from the dust. He knows our weakness. He knows our limitations. He knows our sin. And yet he loves us anyway. We're going to sing of uh, the wonderful work of Jesus Christ. I'm always surprised at how little known this is. It's a, this, the, the hymn we're about to sing. It's a Getty and Townend hymn. It should be one of those... Um, I've got lots of opinions about what should be popular carols. You'll have to forgive me over the next few weeks. You've already heard several this morning. But this should be uh, a, a famous carol, I think. I know it's been written fairly recently, but it's, it's a wonderful expression of what it is we celebrate at Christmas time from the squalor of a borrowed stable. It's not the same. in 1 Timothy 2 is what? The instruction he gives is on what? Prayer. He, he wants the church to know how to pray and to be busy in the work of prayer. It's that important that as we gather we are a praying people. So we're going to turn in prayer again. Let's pray again now. Oh Lord our God, we thank you for this gift of prayer, which is a wonderful expression 
of all that we have in Jesus Christ. Because we who are far off can now come near. Those of us who were lost, and all of us were, have now been saved. We, we were your enemies, but now we're your sons and daughters. We've been adopted into your family. And we can come with this free access into your throne room of grace. And we can pray. We can talk to you. We can lay before you all the desires of our hearts, the anxieties, the needs of our own lives, our church, and this world. And Lord, we thank you for this amazing privilege. Lord, as we've already prayed, make us a praying people. We do lift up to you the church of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout this world. We feel the burden, O oh Lord, for your church where it is still languishing in prison. The Apostle Paul wrote 2,000 years ago, languishing in prison to Timothy. And many of your people, indeed tens of thousands of your people, are even tonight in prison, incarcerated, locked up from family, friends and churches, from freedom, in places of prison. And Lord, we ask that wherever they are, in countries far off, Lord, that you would draw near to them and bless them. We, O oh Lord, are looking forward to, over the next few weeks, a Christmas time with family and friends, celebrating, eating, drinking, singing carols, thanking you with your people for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of your people around the world will not dare to avail themselves of those opportunities. We think of, of Afghanistan, and we pray for your people in Afghanistan. Lord, the, the, your people that have been forced underground, your people that are fleeing from that country, your people that are already under death threats and threats to be imprisoned or worse. Lord, have mercy. Please bring stability and peace and help to that country so that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ may yet again worship in freedom. Lord, we also want to pray for China. And we're so thankful for Christopher and Linnell and for their daughters and we had them here recently and their desire to go to that great land as missionaries. We thank you, O oh Lord, that even just in the last week or so, the 80% of the funding that they need to start planning has come in. And we praise you for that, Lord, because even just in the last three or four months, that a substantial amount of support has come in for them, from individuals and from churches and from many uh, from our own small Presbyterian denomination, we give you thanks. And as they now begin to make plans when the timing is right in the coming year to head back uh, to, to China, Lord, please bless them in every way. Please provide for all their needs. Please open the door for them. And we ask that you would bring a fruit to their ministry that would redound to your praise and to your honour and to your glory. That the many millions who do not know you, that, that do not have the word of God in their own language, that do not have churches proclaiming your word, would be established and that the many millions would hear your name and bow before the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless us at this time. We have a busy week or so ahead. We're feeling our weakness in many ways with coughs and colds and with COVID. We lift up those of our, our number who can't be with us, though would love to be, who have either, who have either been tested positive or have had contact with those that have, some of whom are ill and unwell. Lord, please put your hand upon them. We pray for those that are hoping to travel back home or across the world to visit friends and family in the next week or so. And we ask that you keep them COVID free and that you may make their travel possible and that their time with family and friends would be a blessed time over Christmas and New Year. Please bless all of our activities. Bless our, our fellowship evening this Thursday. Give us sweet times of fellowship and encouragement together. Bless us as we have our kids club on uh, a week Monday and the youth meet, as we have our carol services, as we meet on Christmas Eve. Lord, our great God, please be with us in our weakness, in our need, and fill us afresh with something of the awe and the mystery of the God who became man, Emmanuel, for us.
Lord, be with us, we ask. And bless the witness of our church as well. Lord, finally, we do want to lift up Adassa to you. Lord, we know the last few weeks have been tough in many ways for her, for Joshua, for Eve, for the baby that she's carrying in and out of hospital with various contractions, various false starts. Lord, please put your hand upon her dad so she had to go into hospital again today. Lord, be with her, be with Joshua, be with Eve, be with the baby that she's carrying. And Lord, when the right time comes, we ask that that, that birth would, would happen quickly, without any complications, and that you would bless Joshua and Hadassah and Eve with, with, a new, with a new baby, a new child, and that you, you, that child will be safe and well. We lift these things up to you. Lord, we look forward to hearing from your word in just a moment. And we're so thankful for David and Steve being with us and for the fellowship we have with them and with Wadham Road Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Cheltenham. Bless that church. Bless the ministry of that church. Bless the people there. May they know your peace and blessing on them at this Christmas time. Hear our prayers then, Lord. Forgive our sins. Be with us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Well, we're going to sing again in a moment, before, but before we do that, let's confess our faith together. If you're able to, let's stand. I invite you to stand as we come to confess our faith. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I'm not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Let's remain standing as we sing our next hymn. Who is this so weak and helpless child of lowly Hebrew maid? Okay. 
it's wonderful to have uh, David Pfeiffer with us. David is uh, a personal friend of mine and a one, one or two in this congregation. Uh, so are you, Steve, just in case you're a little bit worried there. Great to have you with us here as well. Um, David is Minister of, uh, if you don't know the geography of the United Kingdom, if you go west an hour, you hit the glorious, wonderful town of Cheltenham, known uh, for many things, uh, most of all the Wadham Road Evangelical Presbyterian Church, where David is the minister. And uh, one of the things we do as Presbyterians is, if we don't have, we believe in the plurality of elders. We, we nowhere have a church where there's only one elder. We always have more than one. We think this is very, very important. We think it's biblical. We think this is what Paul did. Uh, and here right now in Oxford Evangelical Presbyterian Church, there is only one elder, so we need another one. And so we borrow an elder. There's a special name. It's called an assessor elder, but a borrowed elder. And David, since the beginning of Oxford Evangelical Presbyterian Church, has been a borrowed elder. And he's a wonderful support and encouragement. And we try and get him through to come and preach two or three times a year, uh, as much as we can. So it's great to have you with us, David. Let me just say, we, uh, uh, one of our ambitions, and I know David would agree with this, is to do it out of a job in the next year or so. So we wouldn't need to borrow any more elders. We'd have our own plurality of elders from within our church. So I'd encourage you to be praying about that. But it's wonderful to have you with us, David. Send our love back to Wadden Road and you, Steve, and also to your family, Bethan and the children, and to Mim as well, Steve. Thank you. Over, I'll hand over to you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for your welcome. It's great to be here, and um, it's great to see you. Um, it's good as a borrowed elder to actually be in the congregation, to see your faces, and we can report back to our church and we can pray for you. And uh, everything that Andy has just said... Um, I would echo, in fact, I was going to say exactly that, um, but he's, um, he's not stolen my thunder, I'm just re-echoing his. So, um, yes, I'm here to do myself out of a job, um, although it's a job that I very much love. And Andy is a borrowed elder for Wadden Road, and we're very grateful to him and uh, the, the love and care he shows to us too. So, it's great to be here. Uh, we're going to read in a moment from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. So if you have a Bible, do turn there. If you have a church Bible, it's page 886. Um, but before we read from that and hear God's word read, I'm going to pray. So let's pray together. Our glorious God, we are conscious that you are infinitely high above us. You are outside time and space. You're a God who is infinite, eternal and unchangeable. And yet, you're a God who has created a world in which you speak. You created it through your word and you continue to work through your word. You give it in words that we can understand. You stoop to us. But we know that we, by nature, have sinful hearts, and we know that even though we've been changed by grace, by the Holy Spirit, been born again, we still have indwelling sin. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would attend your word, that you would be speaking to us, that you'd clear our minds Lord, that you'd clear our minds of distractions, that you'd help us to focus our hearts on you. Lord, that you'd give us listening ears, that we would be good soil in which the truth can be planted and produce 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold, a harvest of righteousness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So please turn to Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 39 to 56. Um, really there are two sections here. Verse 39 to 45 focuses on Mary's visit to Elizabeth. And then we have Mary's song or Mary's prayer, however we want to say it, in verse 46 to uh, 55 with a closing statement in verse 56. But I am going to look at both these passages together. They're, they are bound together. So let's um, hear God's word uh, read. 
In those days, Mary rose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him, from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Christmas time. That man must be a misanthrope indeed, in whose breast something like a jovial feeling is not roused in whose mind some pleasant associations are not awakened by the recurrence of Christmas. So begins Charles Dickens's Christmas festivities. He's saying that Christmas should be associated with, with joy, and you are a man-hater if you do not have such feelings of joy when it comes to Christmas. Christmas is a cause for joy. It's a cause for rejoicing. And let's be honest, we, we need causes for joy. We need reasons to rejoice. Because we live in a broken world. We live in a world where there's disease, where there's divorce, where there's death where there's sin, where there's hatred, where there are problems, problems at work, problems in our families, problems in our church. We're surrounded by them. And some of you perhaps feel them peculiarly, acutely at this time. Uh, perhaps there are some in your congregation who feel the brokenness of this world. And the Bible doesn't whitewash these things. It doesn't say, well, just... Just forget about them and, and focus, you know, look on the bright side of life. Um, I won't sing it. But uh, it doesn't do that, does it? If you think about the Psalms, um, which are the emotional barometer of the Bible, the most common kind of psalm it is a lament. And yet, in the midst of those reasons for lamenting, there is cause for joy. The Apostle Paul says in a letter where he says it has been gifted to us to suffer, he also says in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice always. There is always reason to rejoice. And this theme of joy is a theme in Luke's Gospel. First comes up. In Luke chapter 1, verse 14, 
uh, where we read about John the baptizer. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. And we see that's exactly what happens in chapter 1 verse 58. John the Baptist is born and her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. That's Elizabeth. And they rejoiced with her. But it's not just in these uh, infancy narratives. It's also uh, in the heart of the gospel. So if you went to Luke chapter 10, verse 20, the Lord Jesus instructs his disciples who have cast out many demons and done many great works. And he says to them in Luke 10, verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Don't rejoice in all those things that you've done, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And then Jesus himself in the very next verse, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. He himself rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And then when we think about uh, the story with Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus, the little man who had to climb on a tree to see the Lord Jesus. And Jesus says, I want you to come down and come into your house for tea, as it says in the chorus, um, we read Zacchaeus' response in Luke 19, verse 6. He hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And then the very last uh, two verses of the Gospel of Luke ends with a note of joy. And they, that's the disciples, worshipped him. Luke 24, verse 52 and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. And you could actually follow this through into Acts as um, Christ rejoices in the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts, the, the church rejoices in the Holy Spirit. And in this passage that we have before us, these two passages which are linked together, they're linked by this theme of joy. Look at Luke 1 verse 44. Where Elizabeth says, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And then the same root word is used in verse 47, where Mary says, And my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Here, two women and one six month baby. Rejoice. Uh, and their rejoicing, of course, is unique because it's a unique time in history. Uh, this, doesn't, this has only happened once. And yet, when we look at Mary's song, look what she says in verse 50. She says, And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And she's saying that the joy that I am experiencing is not just for me and for now, it is for all who fear him. And so in this passage, I want us to think about four reasons to rejoice, four reasons that we can have joy. So let me mention them. First of all, the first reason from this passage is the faith of Mary. The faith of Mary is a reason for rejoicing. Begins with Mary, uh, going with haste, remember she's from Nazareth, going down to the hill country to a town in Judah. And this would have been um, something of a, it would have been a 70 mile, around about a 70 mile journey. And, and she can't just get out and get in a Ford uh, Fiesta or whatever it is and go down and do an hour and a half drive. It, it would have been a long time, it would have taken several days to get down. But we read, don't we, that she goes with haste. She goes with haste. She goes hurriedly. She goes with speed. And she goes down to see her cousin Elizabeth because of what we read in verse 36, the passage before, where the angel Gabriel says to Mary, and behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. And that is a sign to Mary, that what the Lord has said to her, that she would conceive, even though she's a virgin, is true. It's a confirmatory sign 
And so what does she do? She runs, she rushes down because she wants to see that it's true. She believes the angel Gabriel. So her faith causes her to act with haste. That's what faith does. It, it leads to action. And then she arrives with Elizabeth, who greets her. And Elizabeth, we're told, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she says, blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Uh, Mary is peculiarly blessed. Mary has a unique place in the history of redemption. We shy away from this as Protestants. Um, we, we, we don't like the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And so we tend to shy away from it. I have no problem in saying Mary is the mother of God. You can throw tomatoes at me, but I have no problem in that. Saying that she's the mother of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. She's not the mother of the divine nature. Not at all. Jesus is the eternal son of God from eternity. But she does have a unique place in redemptive history, just as Moses did. Just as Noah and Abraham and Ruth and David and John the baptizer will have. She has a unique role in God's plan. But her unique instrumentality in the plan of God is in conjunction with her faith. Notice what Elizabeth says in verse 45. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. I'm really glad Andy chose the... Um, the hymn from, um, from the squalor. Notice what it says at the beginning of that, of that hymn. From the squalor of a borrowed stable by the Spirit and a virgin's faith. Blessed, says Elizabeth, is she who believed that there would be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. It's a wonderful news that Mary believed this impossibility. It's wonderful news. It's miraculous faith that God had given her to believe this impossibility. That she would conceive, whilst being a virgin, and more than that, that she would conceive the one who is the eternal son of God become man. Her faith had an instrumental role in the purposes of God. You can think about the catalogue in Hebrews 11 by faith. By faith, by faith Abel did this, by faith Noah did this, by faith Abraham did this, etc. Well, by faith, Mary receives this promise. A man called John of Damascus said this in his exposition of the Orthodox faith. I don't agree with everything he's written. I don't take me to task on that. But he said this, the conception indeed was through the sense of hearing. <coughs> And, and, and someone else says, her ear was the bodily organ of this miraculous conception. Just as the Lord says to Abraham, because you have believed and not withheld your son, I will give you these promises and it will be true. So he or she believes and it comes to pass. Of course, the credit doesn't ultimately go to Mary. Because her faith is a miracle of God's grace. She only believes because God has given her the faith to believe. And that's true of us too, isn't it? Here's a reason to rejoice. Here's a reason to rejoice for you. You believe. That's not something that's natural or native to you. It's not because you're American or because you're British or because of this or that or the other. It's not in your genes. It's a miracle that you believe. You would not, apart from the supernatural intervention of the Holy Spirit, believe in God. You wouldn't. You would be dead in your trespasses and sins. But you do. And that's a reason to rejoice. You believe in God. You believe in the Lord Jesus. Before we move on, just another element to Mary's faith. 
Uh, we're not going to go into this into detail, but if you look at her song, uh, some of you will have perhaps an ESV Bible, you'll, you'll have um, references down the middle, do you have that? And you've got all the references to the Old Testament. What you see is that her song or her prayer is just full of the Old Testament. How does faith grow? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She's full of it. She's saturated. Her song is Bible saturated. How does faith grow? Faith grows by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's what we see here. Mary believes. She's heard the word and believes. So that's the first reason to rejoice. The faith of Mary. The second reason to rejoice is the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus. Twice we're told, aren't we, in this passage, in verse 41 and verse 44, that John, who is in the womb of Elizabeth, leaps, leaps in her womb. Some of you, I know there's a lady here who has a baby, this was some kick in the womb. She felt it, leaped for joy, and she knows she's full of the Holy Spirit. She rightly interprets it. He leaped for joy. Just as an aside, think of this for a moment. A six-month-old in the womb leaps for joy at a perhaps only a few days old in the womb. Doesn't that show us the dignity and the value of life in the womb? But when we think of John's leap here, we should remember who John is. John is the final... Old Covenant prophet. He is the one that comes at the end of a long line of prophets. We could say that he, in one sense, sums up the whole of the Old Testament. He's the hinge on which history turns. G John and Jesus are, are the hinge. John is at the end, on one side of the hinge. Jesus is on the other side of the hinge, on which history turns. So as John leaps with joy here... The whole of what the Old Testament represents leaps for joy. All the prophets, as it were, leap for joy in John. All of the Old Testament leaps for joy at Jesus because he is the one to whom the whole of the Old Testament has been pointing. The coming of Jesus rightly divides the Bible. It rightly divides history. With the Christ event, his coming, life, death, resurrection and ascension, the last days have been inaugurated. There is only one date left, circle on God's calendar, and that is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. History is not an endlessly repeating cycle. That's such a, it's like, there's the film, isn't there, Groundhog Day. And it's so depressing, isn't it? Round and round and round and round and round. I wonder about what, if, if that's a reason why people get down. Just life is just a continuous cycle, a boring cycle. Just goes round and round and round and round. But the coming of Jesus tells us it's not that. It's, it's heading somewhere. And so this leap for joy is not just, oh, he's going to be a good cousin of mine. It's... He's come. History's moving forward. A decisive event has taken place. And just as he came 2,000 years ago, he will surely come again. That's a reason to rejoice. The coming of Jesus means that history is heading somewhere. That's good news for you and for me. And we will see in the next point where that history is heading. Because third reason to rejoice it's not only the faith of Mary, not only the, the, um, the coming of Jesus, but third, the reversal of fortunes. The reversal of fortunes. And now we're going to focus on Mary's uh, words, Mary's song in verses 46 to 55. Mary responds in joy, just as Elizabeth rejoices, just as the baby in the womb of Elizabeth, John rejoices. Now Mary rejoices and she gives us a poem which has become well known. We sometimes refer to it 
as the Magnificat because she magnifies the Lord. And it's an intensely personal song, isn't it? Do you notice the number of first person pronouns? Verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, referring to himself again. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. It's intensely personal. He's done something amazing for me. I am the mother of my Lord. God has looked down on Mary in her humble condition, a young girl from Nazareth, a nobody from nowhere. And given her an immense privilege. And the Lord loves to do that. He loves to take the nobodies from nowhere. Because he's saying it's all about my sovereign grace. It's all about my mercy and love. She will carry and nurture the saviour of the world. Out of the billions of women who have ever lived. God chose Mary. That's what she's reflecting. It's amazing. She chose, he chose Mary. But what God has done for Mary is indicative of what God does for his people. It's not a flash in the pan, so to speak. This is the way God operates. And you see in verse 50, the song widens. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. It's not just for me, it's for all who believe in him. It's for all who trust in him. God's looking down on her in her humility and lifting her up is a picture of what he does for all God's people. And the Lord's salvation, she describes God as her saviour in verse uh, 47, is an act of reversal. It's an act of reversal. Did you see that? That's really summing up what the song is about. He's shown strength with his arm, verse 51. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. He brings down those who are high and he raises up those who are low. It's a reversal. It's a turning of fortunes. A reversal of fortunes. The proud. Those who have liked the Tower of Babylons. No, that's probably not a word, is it? Sought to resist God um, with and his purposes, making a name for themselves rather than glorifying God. Those who, who set themselves up as the kings of their lives, who oppose God, who, who shake their fists at God, who says, I, I will make a name for myself, not glory to God, but glory to me. They will be scattered. But those who've humbled themselves, who fear God, who recognise their own unworthiness, but God's supreme worthiness, he will lift up. And this is a theme in Luke's Gospel. Think of a couple of stories from Luke's Gospel. Think of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man is so wealthy, has so much. Uh, and Lazarus, um, is as a beggar and, and he sores because the dogs lick. He's a, he's a nothing, he's a nobody. And all he wants is to have the crumbs from, from, from the rich man's table. But then what happens? There's a great reversal. They both die and the rich man goes to hell. And Lazarus is, is in Abraham's bosom. The, the rich man has, has had no concern for anyone but himself. Lazarus is known by God, received by God. And there's a reversal there. Or think, for example, in Luke 18, of um, what I like to call the peacock and the pig. The peacock and the pig. The, pr the, pr there's a, the peacock who, who goes around, uh, the, the Pharisee. Um, Lord, I, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you. I, I tithe of all that I have. I... I, I, I Fast twice a week. I do that and, uh, and the other. I'm not like the adulterers. I'm not like the, the riffraff. I'm special. I thank you, O oh God. 
And then there's the, the tax collector, the pig. People would have hated him. Looked down at him, treated him like dog dirt. He comes in, he can't even look up to heaven, he just beats his breast. He said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But then we read at the end of that, that the, the pig is the one who is justified before God. He's the one who's raised up, and the other isn't. God reverses things, and it shows us that this reversal it is both spiritual and physical. There's a spiritual dimension to it. Those who, who humble themselves before God, who come in their, their sinfulness, he raises up. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. And we're justified. We're made right with God. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We belong to him. But also when the Lord Jesus returns, there's not many wise, not many noble, not many rich and famous, but we will receive an inheritance and new glorified bodies and the new heavens and new earth. And all the struggles and the strains that we felt will be reversed. There'll be a reversal. So there's a spiritual and physical. There's a, there's a now and there's a not yet. And even, um, even the little things in this life, when the Lord intervenes in our, in our lives in little ways, there are many reversals in our lives. Um, I, we have a member of our congregation uh, at Wadden Road, and, and he has a friend, a friend who's Indian, and um, he was just telling me about how the Lord had intervened in, in this friend's life, and, and managed, he managed to get this um, uh, skills visa and, and, and money supplied, and the, that's the Lord acting, he acts in, in anticipation, in little ways in our lives, and we attribute them to the Lord, he, he acts, but they're anticipations of something much greater a reversal to come. And we may suffer and struggle now. We may not get many of those anticipations, but we know that there's a time coming when it will be reversed. All the oppression, all the injustice, all the tears, all the suffering, all the sighing, all the pain, all the diseases, all the death, it will be removed in the new heavens and new earth. And this, of course, is because it follows the pattern of the Lord Jesus, who was humbled, who went down, who humbled himself. And of course, Luke's gospel focuses on the, at the end, Jesus says, doesn't he, he wrote to Emmaus, ought not the Christ to suffer and then to enter his glory. It follows the Christ pattern of coming down and then being brought up so that those who belong to Jesus can be brought up with him. Christ came, humbled himself, and was exalted and raised. And we in union with him will be raised. And that is a cause to rejoice. We're even raised now. But one day raised with glorified bodies. For eternity. That is a great reason to rejoice. Not just for Mary. But for all of us. My soul magnifies the Lord. The faith of Mary. The coming of Jesus. The reversal of fortune. But finally, and most importantly, the mercy of God. The mercy of God. You see, all that God does as saviour is an outworking of his character. It reveals his character. I want you to notice in the song the references to God's attributes. First of all, his might. Verse 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. The might of God towards us. That's a reason to rejoice. That our God is mighty. That he's able to act. That he does act. He's not an impotent, incompetent God. But he's a mighty God who acts for us. And then his holiness. Look at verse 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His name is all that he reveals himself to be, and he is holy. He reveals himself to be holy in all that he does. And when we read the word holy, uh, sometimes we have sort of uh, notions of somebody being stuck up and holier than thou. The holiness of God is the beauty of God. His holiness is his devotion to himself. 
the Father's devotion to the Son in the Spirit. It's his love for his own goodness. His pure, intense, devoted love to his goodness, which is himself. He is his goodness. And so that means that he hates anything that isn't good. That's why the holiness of God is, is, is in contrast to sin, because it's all that isn't good. He's wholesome and holy and full of life. He hates all that is sinful and, and deathly. And that's a reason to rejoice, the holiness of God. It's not a reason to, um, to, to, to think this is a stuff of God. No, it's his beauty. It's the beauty of the Trinitarian, pure, devoted, ardent love. But then, the attribute that stands out is his mercy, isn't it? His mercy. Look at verse 15. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And then look verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And that word mercy there is probably translating a Hebrew word which is the word chesed, which is the word covenant love, steadfast love. And you can look in the Old Testament at references to that. It's his steadfast, gracious, covenant love. And it finds its expression in his promises to Abraham, his promise to Abraham, that in him the whole world would be blessed. The world was cursed in Adam, but in Abraham's seed it would be blessed, turning over the curse. God would overturn the curse of Adam through the blessed one of Abraham. And in remembrance of that covenant promise, God shows his mercy, his steadfast love, his never giving up, always forever, gracious love, covenant love. And what we see then at Christmas is that God is shouting out to the world, I've not given up on you. I've not given up on you. In fact, I'm absolutely fully committed to rescuing this world. I'm committed to rescuing my people and through my people rescuing the world. I will not let you go. I have decisively acted so that you will not perish, so that you will live, so that you will last, so that you will be rescued. And that is the reason for joy. It's God himself. It's his steadfast, gracious, never giving up, always, forever, covenant love, which flows from his love in himself and expresses itself in his promises, which are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason to rejoice. The reason to rejoice is God himself, who God is. His holiness, his might, his love, his mercy. So we have reasons to rejoice. Faith of Mary, the miraculous faith of Mary, the coming of Jesus. The reversal of fortunes. But most of all, because it all flows from this, the character of God. And my prayer is for you, my prayer is for myself, that we would all learn and grow and be able to rejoice in God. To rejoice in who he is. To rejoice in all that he is for us. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are for us in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you've acted in history, acted in promise, acted in fulfilment in the Lord Jesus. We thank you that one day the Lord Jesus will return and that there will be a great reversal. We thank you that you have given us faith to believe. We thank you that Jesus has come, that history isn't an endless cycle, 
but it's going somewhere. It's going to a final day when Jesus will return to a new heavens and a new earth. Lord, give us reason to rejoice this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to um, sing now this wonderful hymn which is based on Mary's song. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord, unnumbered blessings, give my spirit voice. Tell out my soul, I sing together.